The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. We're honored that you're tuning in with us this morning, and we're honored to welcome Dr. John Townsend to preach this morning as well. Would you join me in the declaration this morning? I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to talk about energy today. Anybody got too much energy right now and you just wish you could, <laughs> you have too much energy. Okay, we're going to siphon her. That'll be great. Because life takes a lot out of us and we all need to have things like a positive attitude and resiliency because life can be challenging and energy. And um, as I study people, most of my work is with leaders and organizations. I, I, I find out that there's only one group in the world, one demographic, we would say, where people have too much energy. And that's uh, what are called three-year-olds. <laughs> they have too much. I wish they had less. But if you've got kids or grandkids, you understand that. But the rest of us, we have to get certain, I don't know, encouragements in life. And, and what you find is that as people of faith, we know that God is the source of all the energy we need and, and the positivity and the resilience we need. And what I found as I study these matters and study successful people is that there's really two dimensions of this. There's what's called the vertical, or I, I use the, the term vertical in my book, People Fuel. And, the, and, and vertical means all the ways we get help and encouragement from God himself, like prayer and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Bible. We get lots of energy and positivity and resilience from those things. We're strengthened for the day. But there's another thing the Bible talks about, and that is the horizontal. And the horizontal is each other. And there are hundreds of Bible verses about how important we are to encourage and help each other out. That it's not just about the vertical, that God created a system where there's both. For example, if you go to Genesis chapter 2, where God says it's not good that a person be alone. That's not a passage about marriage, actually, in the Hebrew. It's a passage about relationship, that God said, I'm here for you, and you've got this world, wonderful world, Adam, but you don't have another like you. That's horizontal. You go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 where Solomon says, woe to you if you fall down, there's not another, another to lift you up. That's not a passage about God. It's a passage about people. Then you go to Matthew 26, where Jesus is in the Passion, and he's sweating great drops of blood. He's in excruciating pain as he's anticipating the future. And while he's with the Father, having everything the Father has for him, he turns around to three people, Peter, James, and John, and he says, sit with me, for my soul is distressed. So even Jesus needed people as well. What I've noticed is that a lot of us are kind of weird about that. It's just kind of hard. We don't want to be takers like Chad and I were talking about earlier. We feel like we're being high needy or we're selfish. And let me give you a little story about that. Um, a lot of times a, a company will hire me or a board will bring me in to work with their leader. And, and I'll come in to, to kind of give a report card for how they're doing in their job. And I'll look through their P&Ls and their balance statements and their vision and their strategy. And then I'll have a day with the, with the CEO. And I'll say, okay, you look great. Things look wonderful. How are you doing relationships? And, they'll, and the, the leader will always say, I don't have relationship problems. I knew you were coming. So that's kind of a problem. So I'll say, great. Well, I'll say, but tell me about, you know, what you do about relationships. Now, I've got a million relationships. I'm leading these people and guiding these people and mentoring these people and developing these people. And I'll go, Man, that's great. That's all outgo, though. Where's your ingo? And then generally they'll say, well, if they're a person of faith, they'll say, God is my ingo. I'll say, great, we need God, the vertical. And they'll say, also, um, my Labrador retriever, Max. 
gives me great ingo because Mac licks me when I'm upset and I'm insecure and I'm afraid. Mac will love, Max will love me unconditionally. I say, go for Max. And also my spouse who knows my fears and knows my insecurities is always there with me. I said, great. Let me kind of give you an analysis of this. God's going to do what he's going to do and that's who he is. That's great. Check. Max is genetically engineered to lick your face because he won't eat otherwise. So <laughs> I, you have to think about that. And your spouse is really getting tired and burnt out. <laughs> and by then, the spouse comes in the room and says, listen to this guy, Harem. Listen to him. Can you get some people besides me? Because I love you, but like I'm burning out here. Can you like do something weird, like get a friend? <laughs> and so my conclusion is that most of us, whoever we are, are, are pretty much in relational deficit, that we don't get enough of what we need. Well, in the book, I talk about the, the phrase relational nutrients. And this is about more of the brain that we're supposed to give things to each other, give and take, give and take, not in a pill form, but in a conversation or a text or maybe a, a phone call or maybe lunch or whatever, where my brain is conveying good things to your brain and your brain is conveying good things to my brain. And that's what health is about. And so in the model, I have... 22 relational nutrients, much, much more information than we need to go into today. But I have them organized into four quadrants, four, you know, sections of types of nutrients we're supposed to give to each other. And as we learn how to give people what they need and how to ask for what we need, it kind of makes the life go around. And that's our source of energy and positivity and resilience. So I want to take you through this. Now, if you have your handout, we're going to talk about the first quadrant quadrant meaning corner. And in the first one, it talks about being present, present, to be present with one another. Being present just means not to talk so much and to be there with somebody in their area of challenge. You know, in the, in the book of Job, the only good thing that his friend, three friends did in chapter 2, it says that they sat with him seven days and seven nights and did not speak a word to him for they saw his pain was very great. His grief was very great. Just being present with someone. Now, what I love about this is that everything the Bible says about being present, comfort one another, accept one another, is all affirmed in neuroscience. Most of what I study these days is neuroscience, which is the science of the brain and how it functions. And all of the robust studies that come out from neuroscience all affirm that the Bible had it right from the very beginning. Everything God says about relationships, it's about love and about success and about challenge and about, you know, dealing with, with, with hard times. The neuroscience says God was right the first time around. So we're not just talking about kumbaya stuff right now. We're talking about solid, solid Bible teaching and hard science. And the best, best, best outcome in the whole world is when you see hard science backing up what the Bible says. Now, in being present, this is hard for us, though, because sometimes we want to give people advice and cheer them up, and there's a time to cheer people up. But there's a reason that quadrant one is about being present. And I'll tell you a story about this in my own life. Our family, when our kids were small, we would go We'd find other families that were like ours and we got along and there was great chemistry and we go do vacations together. Just, it's a fun vacation to be with people that you love. And so we were with one family and dear, dear friends, we'd known their children since birth. And this has been a long time. The kids have grown up and everybody's a young adult now. And so we're in the vacation site and one of the, the young gals that I'd known since she was a baby, she comes up and she says, I need to talk to you. And I said, great. Uh, I said, what's going on? She says, I've got some problems. And I said, oh my gosh, tell me. She goes, well, um, I'm a senior in university. I'm, gonna, I'm going to be graduating with a communications degree. And I said, I'll pray for you. <laughs> How many communications majors we got here, right? <laughs> Wasn't easy. She said, that's not all. And I said, okay, what's all? She goes, well, Spencer and I broke up. 
I said, Spencer, don't tell me that. I just love Spencer. We took him out to dinner. We thought he was God's guy for you. And you guys had this great chemistry and it was wonderful. Don't tell me. He says, I don't want to go into it, but it's over and I'm just a mess and I'm so sad. And I said, I'm so sorry. She said, I've got a third problem. And I go, tell me. She goes, I'm not sure I believe in God anymore. And I go, oh, my heart just sank. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she said, well, I'm in a university with 40,000 students and we have all these conversations late at night about different ideas and I'm taking these world religion courses and I'm not really sure if it's really my faith in Christ or if it's like something scotch taped on my head by mom and dad and, you know, I really haven't owned it for myself. She'd grown up, her, her parents are really, really wonderful Christians and she grew up in a Christian church. But she said, I just might be not me. And I, ha I had so much, um, gosh, concern for her and identification because I knew someone in their 20s who also, back in that day, had relationship problems and job problems and faith problems. And it was me. So I got it. So I said, so how can I help you? And she said, there's one thing you can do. I said, I'll do anything. She said, um, fix my mother. Well, how do we get from job and God and all that to... She goes, I'll tell you. She says, you know my mother. I said, yeah, she's one of my best friends. She goes, well, when I tell her these struggles, these three struggles, job, relationship, faith, my mother will look at me and she'll go, honey, listen to me. You're smart. You're resilient. You're positive. Feel better. Now, did you guys just feel the angels come down when I said that? You all look beautiful now, like you're wonderful. I said, well, that's kind of not working. She goes, no, it doesn't work. I said, what do you do? She says, I'll ignore her. I said, okay, I get that. So what can I do? She says, well, go talk to her. I said, how are you and your dad? I always check these out. How are you and your dad going? She goes, dad and I talk all the time. I said, great. So I knew it was kind of not a two-parent problem. It was a one-parent problem. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll talk to your mom. And by the way, I'm on vacation, and now I'm on the clock, but I had no feelings about that at all. <laughs> so... We go to, I, I grab mom because, you know, anytime you're on a vacation, there's only three places that you can have the real talk. You know, it's the fun talk, but sooner or later you got to have the real talk, right? And there's only three places. The first place is in the kitchen when everybody's in the dining room. That's one place. The second one is in that third bedroom upstairs where nobody goes. You have the talk there. And the next place is in the backyard where the swing is. I mean, there's tons of great research about this. So I said, to mom, can we go to the swing? We got to talk. And she goes, sure. So we go to the swing and I said, okay, your daughter is sort of in trouble. She goes, I know. And I said, you know, she's got boyfriend problems and job problems and faith problems. She goes, I know. And I said, she tells me she tells you about it. She goes, yes, yeah, she does. And I said, she tells me that you tell her that she's smart and positive and resilient. She goes, yeah, that's true. And I said, she tells me she doesn't really listen to that. She goes, yeah, she doesn't. <laughs> Fix my daughter. <laughs> so now I'm in really in trouble. So I said, what do I have to fix? She goes, well, you're a shrink. And you know what you guys do. I've got, God gave me these nuggets of advice and positivity and wisdom. And so open up her brain and shove the nuggets in there and close her brain back up and lock it and she'll be happy. So you do that, you're, you're a shrink. And I go, kind of didn't work like that. And she said, well, how's it work? I said, well, look at it this way. <clears throat> Your daughter fell down a well. She fell down an awful well of big challenges. It's a 40-foot well of hard times. She's, she's got a boyfriend issue and a loss issue, and she's got job anxiety, and she's got faith issues. and She's overwhelmed, and she's scared, and it's dark in there, and she doesn't know what to do. Now, you... You love her deeply, and you want her to have a good life. And so you come in, and you look down the well, and you see her, and you care about her, and you want to help. But from your vantage point, the sky is blue, and Alexa is playing Hillsong. So that's always positive, all right? And, you know, like, everything's good, and you look down, and you say, Honey, you're positive and you're resilient and you're smart. Come on up, like Bob Barker used to do. Come on up. 
and she doesn't. She goes, okay, what do I do? I said, well, let me tell you what your husband does, and they're both very dear friends. So your husband looks at y'all's situation with your daughter there, and he sees y'all's daughter, and he looks in the well, and he leans over, and then he jumps in the well. 40-foot well, lands in the bottom, and he picks your daughter up, and he holds her, and he says, it's really dark, and it's really overwhelming, and it's really scary, and I've got you. I've got you, and I've got you until we're ready to get out. I'm here. And really, that's why she listens to him and not you. And my friend said, you're telling me to jump in the well. I said, I am. You're a mom, you're a leader. She goes, that's just not my nature. It's so hard for me. I'm more of the encourager, give advice. I have lots of good truth to encourage. I said, we need that. Lord knows we need that in this world, but you're, you're, the order is wrong. If you go to John chapter 1, verse 14, well, the, John the Apostle is talking about the character of Jesus. And in verse 14, he says something very important. He says that Jesus came to our world full of grace and truth. And the, the Greek syntax is very relevant there. It doesn't say he came full of truth and grace. Grace, then truth, because you've got to earn the right to give the truth by giving grace. You've got to earn the right to say, here's some advice for you, by being in the well with someone. Anybody here ever gotten truth by someone who wasn't in the well with you? It tends not to go well. You know, you either feel like judged or somebody's being your parent or they've got it together or whatever. You tend to kind of push against people who don't really get you and understand you and don't take any time to understand you. Grace has got to come before truth. I said, she said, well, that's just hard. I said, I know it's hard, but work on it. Put duct tape on your mouth or something. Do something. But you can do this. So vacation's over, and I just checked back in a few weeks later, and I talked to the daughter. She says, Mom and I talk all the time now. It's much better. And I talked to Mom. She says, yes, it's much better. So the story ended well. Now, since I wrote the book and had that story in there, it's kind of the central part, I've talked to so many organizations and churches and pastors and leaders. And I can tell what 90% of us are thinking right now as we hear this talk. And it's this, I've got to get better about getting in the well with my kids, with my employees, with my friends, with my grandkids. I've got to get better about getting in the well because I just tend to like give a bunch of advice that never does anything. It's a great thought, it's a good thought, but I want you, let me just invite you to put that thought on the, you know, the parking lot in the back of your head for a second. Because I have another thought I want to give you that I'd like to, you to think instead. For now. And it's this. It's just seven words. Here they are. Who am I inviting to my well? Who am I inviting to my well? I have challenges, my health challenges, my relationship challenges, financial challenges, things in my work, things in my head. Who am I asking to be in the well with me? That is so much harder because we feel like, oh gosh, I'm selfish, I'm high demand. And I want to challenge that assumption. That's a cognitive assumption because my experience is that when people take a risk and ask somebody to be in their well, that their friends and their people that care about them are, they feel privileged. They feel like it's an honor. You've been talking to me about my life and my problems for 20 years at lunch. Can we make it about you? I would love to. I'm so grateful that you're such a cool person. So I want you to take a risk or consider taking a risk that way. Because how do we otherwise give to other people what we don't possess? If nobody's ever been in my well, it's going to be very hard for me to be in your well. That's the first quadrant. The second one, as you go down in your, in your handout, is provide the good. The good. Sometimes we do get discouraged. Life is hard. We need somebody to kind of be that emotional Prozac for us and say, you're okay with me. Encourage us. Tell us we're okay. And everything changes. I, 
I was having a meeting with one of my staff, and we, we had a 45 minute meeting just about how the last week was going. And she's, she's, a, she's wonderful, she does great work. And uh, so whenever the, what we went on, here's the plan, here's the answers. And she's walking out of my office. And I said, it's great to see you. And she's walking and she turns around and she goes, by the way, I'll never forget she said that. She says, by the way, am I doing a good job? And I, I said, why are you asking? She goes, it's just been a really rough week. Do you think I'm doing a good job? I said, you're a rock star. I'm so happy we're working together. I, I put my head on the pillow at night feeling better because I know you're running things. She goes, okay, that's all I want to know. Two hours later, I got a text from me. She goes, that just made my week. That was what, a 30 second, 15 second thing. And she said, it changed everything. Sometimes we just got to convey good things to each other. So remember how, like if you fly a lot, there's a thing called TSA. Anybody know what TSA is? <laughs> and TSA always says, if you see it, say it. Like if there's a little black bag that's ticking. <laughs> if you see, that's probably a good idea to say something. If you see something, somebody doing something well, just kind of catch them and say, hey, that was great. They need it and you need it. Third quadrant is to de deliver reality, to provide reality. Sometimes we need sort of a, anybody ever remember uh, Fellowship of the Rings and all that and Two Towers and The Hobbit and there was Gandalf and he always had this wise kind of answer or if you're a Star Wars junkie, it was always Yoda. But we all need Yoda, Gandalf kind of figures in our life who are really smart and intuitive and, and, very, and, and, and understand answers. Maybe it's something in your financial situation where they can really be strategic. Or maybe it's something in your, your parenting or grandparents, somebody can say, I've got a lot of experience with this. And they give us wisdom and perception and, and they help us. Sometimes we need people to provide reality for us. I was working with a couple who had an out-of-control kid. And, I mean, you know, I've raised kids. They're out of control, kind of like, that's a redundancy, but, you know, they just kind of are. And the mom was like, i got to give him good boundaries. And you ever heard that word, boundaries? Um, good boundaries and a lot of love. And, good, and she was really balanced. And the dad was like, he's got to toe the line. He's got to toe the line. I felt like I was with a really harsh guy. And I said, I'm sorry, i got to take a call here. Your wife's much more imbalanced than you are about this. And I dug down into him. Guess what he had? He had a very, very strict father, strict in a bad way, who could not be pleased. He moved the goalpost. You make a B, the dad says, why didn't you make an A? You make an A, why didn't you make an A plus? You make an A plus, why haven't you always done that? Always moving the goalpost. And I said, I think you're just transferring your hurt onto your child. And he broke down in tears and said, I never thought about it. Oh my gosh. And he turned to his wife and said, I'm going to be a different guy. What in the short process. We had to go through some things. But he's a much better guy. It was just because I had some training in that area. He needed that Gandalf Yoda moment. Go for your Gandalfs. Go for your Yodas. It's really what God does too. He is the Gandalf. He's the Yoda. And the fourth one is to provide, or not provide, but to call to action. Because at the end of the day, we don't change until we behave. We have to do something. We can't just think something and feel something. We have to do something too. The neuroscience research says that if we don't act on something, it can be something you take 10 minutes for you to do. But if you don't do something in seven days after you've heard something good or helpful, in 90 days you will have forgotten 85% of that. And I don't mean like cash aid in a hard drive. I mean gone, deleted, trash. It was never there. 90 days, you lose 85%. So, you know, I'm your speaker today. I think I'm in trouble, right? Because <laughs> I don't want you to forget this stuff, but you have to do something, even if it's a little something, and that will cement it in your head. And it'll become a, a, a permanent habit for the rest of your life. We have to do something. So I have a couple of little homework assignments for us. And I, I know everybody's busy, but I want to make them short. So I want to make them short. The first one is this week, ask for a nutrient from a safe person. Hey, can we talk and can I make half the lunch about me? I got a challenge. Or I just need to like vent a little bit because I'm frustrated about something. Can you just listen? Take a challenge. I mean, 95% of the people in your life will go, I'd love to. 5% will go, well, it's about me anyway, and that's a problem. But most people say, yeah, how's it going? The second challenge or the second homework assignment, what can you provide for someone in your life this week? Maybe someone in your life needs you to stop giving so much advice and just be in the well of challenge with them. And just say, 
I'm with you. And you know, we know that in the research that men are much better at listening than women. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got the, the notes wrong. I'm sorry. No, 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 that isn't the way it works. Women are better than men. And so guys, that doesn't mean we can pass the baton to them. We're responsible to learn to listen. We're more the doers. Women are responsible to be the doers. It, nobody gets a pass. It's just that they're better than we are, so we've got to be more intentional. So learn things like saying, tell me how that felt, or I'm with you, or that must be o overwhelming or hard, or learn an emotional vocabulary. I have a vocabulary of 110 emotions in the back of the book because we guys have two, happy and hungry. That's all we got. <laughs> so spread it out. But as you do that, give the nutrients to others, ask for nutrients to others. Again, God came up with a system. God wants you to go to Him this way and to each other this way, and that's what makes energy and positivity and resiliency work. So God bless you guys. Have a good day. It is a happy new year. Thank you to everyone who helped us with a special year-end gift. We made it through thanks to you. And now the new year has begun with new hope and renewed optimism. Our Hour of Power team is planning some exciting programs to uplift and bring encouragement throughout 2020, which is our 50th continuous year of broadcasting. We will have heartening messages, excellent music, and inspiring stories, all designed to give you the lift you need each week. As we move forward together, we recognize that we are not owners, but rather managers of the many precious resources that have been entrusted to us. And that includes our relationship with you. You are the church family's living legacy. In the spirit of ongoing friendship, this month we're requesting your feedback as we look to the future and consider how we can most effectively minister to you and your family. We would like your input. You may have already received our Hour of Power survey in your mailbox. If you have, please complete it and return it to us just as soon as possible. Or if you'd like to take your survey online, go to hourofpower.org. Look for the survey indicator and follow the instructions. It should only take you a few minutes of your time. And your responses will enable us to prioritize our focus as we lean into the new and exciting things God is doing in and through Hour of Power in 2020 and beyond. As a way of saying thank you for filling out our survey, we'll send you a beautiful gold metal plated Believe bracelet with a generous gift of any amount. With the word Believe spelled out over an adjustable hinge, this bracelet will be a constant reminder to have faith in God's love and new beginnings. Your donation today will ensure that Hour of Power remains on the air each week to bring you the most inspirational program on television. I know God has an amazing future in store for the Hour of Power, and I invite you to come alongside us in stewarding and expanding our call to reach new generations with the love of Jesus Christ. We look forward to having you join us in celebration as we commemorate the past and embrace the new that awaits as our living legacy unfolds. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.